how many of you have heard of epigenetics before? How many of you have not heard of epigenetics? Okay, about half of you. First of all, uh, this is a photo that I took at one of the Smithsonian museums uh, that a human evolution exhibit, and you can sit down and, and find out what you look, would have looked like at a Neanderthal man. So uh, that's me, actually, uh, on, the, on the right there. Now, one of the pervasive questions in psychology is the nature-nurture debate, right? You know, were you born this way, like Lady Gaga, you know? Uh, or did you, you know, was it the home you were raised in that, you, that caused this development? And let me first emphasize, and you, you probably understand this, it's the original question has really should never have been, is it nature or nurture? Uh, because clearly you can't have one without the other. And the real question was, can differences between people, okay, individual, the variability uh, among a, a trait or characteristic, can it be explained, uh, to what extent can it be explained by genetics versus your environment? And of course, they do the twin studies and family studies, and, and you could get some estimate of the heritability uh, of a characteristic. So your height and weight uh, do have a strong genetic component to them. Um, what religion you are, probably very little genetic contribution to that. Although I do remember a study that found that your attitudes on uh, life issues uh, seems to carry some genetic component, you know, on euthanasia or abortion uh, issues, uh, and even your tendency to like thrilling roller coaster rides, okay, to, to some extent. So, yeah, you can probably find some genetic influence on, on just about any behavior. Um, here's a question, a uh, nature-nurture question. The pose of a champion, okay, is that an innate behavior that the puffed up chest, the arms raised, okay, that that signifies victory over a, over a, over a competitor, uh, you know, and how, did, how do we come to know that? And so this is not certainly a definitive study, but uh, they looked at blind ath wrestlers, okay, who have presumably been blind from birth or uh, at least early on, and they found that after after winning a wrestling match that the winner took the victory pose, okay, as, as Michael Phelps here in this picture, and when they lost, they had kind of the dejected pose, right, you know, the slumped over look. So maybe, you know, that has some genetic uh, inheritance in that behavior. So we, we like to come up with numbers, right, that tell us just how much a, a characteristic is inherited. And heritability is a measure <clears throat> between zero and one. One is perfect uh, genetic inheritance, zero is absolutely none. And you know, we like to look at things like intelligence, and we find that some studies suggest a heritance of up to 0.7 for IQ, whatever that measures, okay, uh, that would suggest there's a strong genetic component. And maybe you, some of you have heard the story of the Jim Twins, right? How many of you have heard the Jim Twins story? Okay, most of you. Look it up if you haven't. Um, amazing similarity in their uh, physical characteristics. They were identical twins that were separated shortly after birth. Uh, but where they vacationed, the type of car they drove, the names of women that they married and divorced and then married again, and uh, their children, and, and so forth. So... Uh, raises some, you know, this is really Im in important and interesting component of our, of our field. So let's just talk just briefly about kind of the hardcore genetics. And we know that chromosomes, we have 23 pairs of them in humans. They have segments upon which uh, we label them genes, uh, which are simply codes of DNA, which are made up of, you know, base pair nucleotides, uh, DNA. Uh, wound up in this uh, helical model. Uh, <clears throat> what did one chromosome say to the other chromosome? Do these genes make me look fat? <laughs> okay. anyway. So, you know, and we know the dominant recessive principle and, and just basic Mendelian genetics, okay? That's, that's probably what you're familiar with and probably even most of your students. We all have high school biology and, and we learn about those round and wrinkled peas. And maybe you've heard um, about Lamarckian evolution and how that is different than, um, I guess, regular evolution. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, does anybody is anybody familiar with Lamarckian evolution that would like to explain it? Steve. Um, was this the one where 
Lamarck said that giraffes got taller because they needed to be taller to eat, and so because they needed, they stretched their necks more, and that's what made them taller, and then therefore their offspring were therefore more taller or something. Precisely, okay. He believed that the use and or disuse of characteristics influenced those characteristics in the offspring. So for example, if you worked out and got big muscles, then uh, your offspring would have more, be more likely to have the same physique uh, of muscles. Uh, maybe you've heard this in popular culture. Well, we keep taking out our wisdom teeth because we don't use them. In the future, people will be born without them, right? Okay, is that true? No, the only way that that will ever be true is if people who are born without wisdom teeth reproduce more than people who are born with wisdom teeth. Okay? So it just so happens that of my children who are old enough to know, uh, none of them have wisdom teeth. Okay? I did, my wife only had two, and so we're, we're lucking out on some uh, oral surgery bills, right? But, um, so anyway, I'm doing my part for human evolution, right? <laughs> Or that um, because maybe we don't use our little toe, then someday we'll be born without the next, you know, the fifth toe, right? I mean, this is the idea. It's kind of popular culture. Well, we know uh, from Mendelian genetics that you know that that can't be true. Uh, giraffes won't have children or offspring with longer necks simply because they stretched theirs. Okay, that makes no sense, right? You know, what, how would that be encoded in the genes that get passed on? Well, you know the real reason why giraffes have long necks. Don't you? <laughs> yeah, oh no. <laughs> well, it's because their heads are so far away from their bodies. Okay? That's, that's why they have long necks. Okay? Connect them, right? Well, Lamarckian evolution was, you know, those were the, the days uh, of past, and, and there was no functional explanation for how that could occur. Well, epigenetics is overturning pretty much everything that we know about uh, the nature-nurture debate. And in fact, in some ways, it's a return to Lamarckian evolution, okay, which, you, which may surprise you. How can that be? <clears throat> Epigenetics, the word literally means above genetics or above the gene code. Uh, we have the DNA sequence. We've done the Human Genome Project. We've got some idea of the 25,000 or so genes that, that humans carry uh, on their chromosomes. But epi means above, and it essentially means a modification of which genes get turned on or off. And surprisingly, it is our exposure to the environment that turns genes on or off. Now that may be no big surprise to you, except that these epigenetic changes, if they occur in the sex cells, can be transmitted to the offspring. Wow. What are epigenetic changes? Well, <clears throat> once again, they're changes in the expression of which genes get turned on or off depending on uh, exposure to things in your diet okay, or in the environment. And the way that these changes take place is, note in this, uh, the winding of the DNA strand around these proteins called histones. And <clears throat> they can be wound so tightly around these proteins that there are certain segments of the DNA code that can be inaccessible for transcription. Okay, so that they can never produce the proteins that they code for. Simply because of a physical covering okay, in this winding of this DNA strand around these histone proteins. That's one way, that's one epigenetic mechanism. is simply by affecting the shape of the histone proteins, then affecting which genes can be exposed physically to be trans transcribed or not. Maybe more importantly okay, is another mechanism which is not shown on this slide but it is later, which is that on the DNA sequence itself you can have a methyl group which is nothing more than a CH3 group, you know, carbon and three, three hydrogen ions uh, attached to it. You can put a methyl group on a sequence of DNA code 
which will either allow that gene to be transcribed or not. Okay. So somebody sounds like we're on a conference call here. Okay. <laughs> So let me, uh, let me talk about one study and then maybe give you some, a few other possibilities of how epigenetic changes may influence uh, behavior. Okay? Uh, this was a study with mice. And these were, I think they were the male mice. I believe these were male mice. Okay? And they did a classical conditioning paradigm with these male fathers in which they paired a kind of a cherry scent or odor with shock. And as you might expect, this odor became a condition stimulus that elicited fear okay, in these animals. Then they bred these fearful fathers okay, with a female rat or mouse, and they measured the offspring's reaction to this novel odor. They've never smelled this cherry scent before. And how did the offspring react? the offspring demonstrate a greater sensitivity to this chemical if their father, prior to conception, had been classically conditioned to fear it. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Because they've got the same DNA sequence as other offspring from non-conditioned fathers. Okay. Same code for this olfactory receptor okay, in the... But what differed was the methylation of that gene code for the receptor. And they found that the offspring of those who had been exposed to the fearful uh, condition, well, whose fathers had been exposed to the fear conditioning, that there was, I think it was less methylation of this DNA sequence, which led to an overexpression of the olfactory receptor that this chemical bound to. Okay, yes? It's the binding of a methyl group onto the DNA sequence. And I, I don't know exactly where it binds, but it's, a methyl group is just a CH3 chemical formula, carbon, ion, carbon atom and three hydrogens. Okay. It just sticks on. And uh, we'll see in a little video I'm going to show you. Uh, binding yeah, it, process onto the DNA. Yes, onto the DNA. Now, the other thing that's interesting, this is a reversible process. Okay. And it probably depends on your diet and not only what the father had been exposed to prior to conception, but what the mother had been exposed to prior to, or to conception or during pregnancy. So let me, uh, yeah, is there another? Um, is it okay if I, oh wait, go ahead. Yes. Um, so if we take some supposition a little farther based on the study, I mean, obviously, you know, it's not causal, but correlational, so we don't, I mean, right? Well, th this, this is causal. This is a pretty... Good design. I mean, it's an experimental design. You, you selectively yeah. breed some who are feared, others who are not, and then look at the offspring and look at the receptor and its methylation. So if you take that situation and apply it to human beings of like being raised in a very stressful environment, for example, in poverty, in conflict, in war, even if, I mean, it could alter the genetic sequence expression if two of those people who are in that yes. community mate and have offspring they're going to be more susceptible to stressors in their environment than those who weren't raised in Possibly. Possibly. So, so I mean, let me tell you. Possibly even more. I, I'm probably going to mess up on some of the details yeah. of this study. But they, it was in, a, in Sweden. And they looked at, there was a, a famine. Mm -hmm. uh, and during that period of famine, individuals who were, I think, prepubescent, okay, they looked at that age and found that their offspring okay, were more susceptible, and I think the dependent measures were cardiovascular disease and maybe diabetes, okay, uh, it was some you know, health-related mm -hmm. outcome. They found a difference, but it was only carried among, I think, the paternal line in one case, and then there was another disease that was carried only through the maternal line. But it depended on their experience when they were young, okay, which influenced their posterity. Now, how long are these epigenetic changes transmitted across generations? We don't know yet, really. Uh, but it seems we know that at least in animals, it can be perpetuated through at least one generation. And I think it was, there was a second generation that they also did. OK, they found it perpetuated. But maybe these are reversible okay, by things that we do later in our life. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you a video. So this is a narrated slideshow that shows how um, these mice who are agouti mice that are a model for diabetes and the gene for diabetes also uh, in some way influences their coat color. So their color of their fur is an indicator of their essentially their susceptibility to diabetes, but it's influenced by epigenetic uh, changes. Hi, I'm Dr. Dana Dolanoy, a postdoctoral research fellow in the laboratory of Randy Jurdel at Duke University. In our laboratory, we study epigenetic gene regulation, or how environmental exposures interact with the epigenome to affect long-term health and disease. So today I'd like to introduce you to two agouti mice. And as you can see, the yellow mouse is quite obese, and she is also prone to diabetes and cancer. But on the other hand, the brown mouse remains slender and lean and also has a lower risk of developing disease. But what's really amazing about these two mice are that they are genetically identical. They are two identical twin sisters from the same mother. So what makes them look so different? Well, it turns out that there is a second genome called the epigenome. Epigenome literally means in addition to or above the genome. And while the recently completed Human Genome Project identified approximately 25,000 genes, these genes still need instructions for what to do and when to do it and where to do it. And that's where the epigenome comes into play. A useful analogy is to think of the epigenome as the software that directs the genomic hardware of a computer. All of our cells contain the same DNA in genes, but it is the epigenome that decides how these genes are expressed and determines how a cell becomes a heart cell, a liver cell, or even a hair cell. Epigenetics consists of molecular switches and markers, such as DNA methylation, that help control gene regulation, in which a quartet of atoms, called a methyl group, attaches to DNA and shuts down genes. And as you can see, the red balls here are attaching to the DNA and turning off the gene. So back to the Agouti sisters. In the yellow obese mouse, the agouti gene is unmethylated and turned on all the time, while in the brown mouse, the gene is completely methylated and shut down. There are also other mice that appear modeled in which half of the cells are methylated and shut down and the other half are unmethylated and turned on, and these mice appear to be yellow and brown. So the coat colors of these agouti mice acts like a sensor for the amount of DNA methylation present. We use the agouti mice to study how maternal nutrients and environmental factors affect the epigenome. Specifically, we wanted to know whether a mom's exposure to a contaminant found everywhere in the environment can alter the fetal epigenome and eventually the long-term fate of her offspring. In this study, pregnant mothers were exposed to a common chemical found in certain plastics this chemical is called bisphenol A, or BPA for short, and it's present in many commonly used products, including food and beverage containers, baby bottles, dental sealants, and the lining of food cans. Um, about four years ago, the CDC studied approximately 400 people, and in 95% of these 400 people, they measured detectable levels of bisphenol A. And when we fed the pregnant mothers, the mice, BPA, we noticed that the number of offspring with the yellow obese coat color increased dramatically. And we also saw that maternal exposure to this chemical decreased DNA methylation in the offspring and turned this agouti gene on when it is supposed to be off. So we started a second study in which pregnant mothers were exposed to BPA plus nutritional supplementation such as methyl donors like folic acid or um, genistein, which is a common ingredient found in soy products. The level of soy that we provided is similar to what a person who eats a high soy diet or an individual living in Asia might eat. And once we did this, we observed that the offspring were no longer predominantly yellow and more obese, and that there were more offspring with the slender uh, brown coat color phenotype. This indicates that maternal nutrient 
supplementation can counteract the negative effects of exposure to that chemical. The traditional thinking about um, human health and disease is that it is affected by genetics and the environment. And whenever identical twins have different disease status, this was often attributed to the environment or different behavioral choices such as smoking status. But with epigenetic gene regulation, we can see that we can no longer say whether genetics or the environment have a bigger impact because it may be not only what you were exposed to, but what your mother and potentially grandparents were exposed to as well, and maybe even your father. These studies with the agouti mice show us that we can no longer say whether genetics or the environment have a greater impact on our health because the two are inextricably linked through the epigenome. This work suggests in the future that we may be able to protect individuals from negative epigenetic profiles either by modifying the diet or developing drugs that can affect epigenomic profiles, although we're several years away from doing this. All right, so what'd you learn? So when you look at the, the two mice, genetically, they would, if you did a fish test on them, genetically they would look identical, correct? The DNA sequence would be the same. And this is not considered to be a copying or deletion error. This is a suppression of a section. Yep. I'm a little confused when you talk about the uh, methyl group. Is that the methyl groups are proteins itself, or the proteins cause a methyl group? The methyl group is just a chemical group, a carbon atom, three hydrogen atoms that bind onto the DNA sequence. And I'm, like I said, I'm not exactly sure what they're binding to. But it's, it's not a protein. It's not a protein. It's not a protein. protein influences the effect. Yeah, there's, there's two different mechanisms. Uh, one is the histone proteins, at which the, the strands wrap around. And those can influence the exposure of the gene sequences to be expressed or not. But the methyl group is a separate epigenetic mechanism that can either turn on or off genes when it, when it binds. Are they supposed to be there, or are they saying it's the environment that inserts those to mess up the code? Like, do well, you normally have methyl groups binding? Um, no. Okay. And, and my understanding is that at certain developmental sequences, it essentially clears the methyl groups off. Okay. Uh, and then maybe further experience seems to add them back. back in. So it's not well, I don't know. What do you mean by? I mean, just by being exposed to our environment, there's, we're going to we're going to have I, methyl I groups. But the default process. setting okay. is is I I don't think there's supposed to be methyl there, groups okay. there. So do we have a question about um, breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, you know this raises questions about everything again, oh, wow. right? It's like, well, gee, does smoking when you're a teenager does that have influence on your posterity? Uh, I even saw headlines about maybe being bullied, you know, as a child, uh, influencing that. And, and, and now we're starting to see that it's not just what the mother's exposed to, maybe even during pregnancy, but what the father was exposed to. And it was another study, I can't remember, I think it was mice or rats, the, the father's epigenetic changes were transmitted to their daughters that led to obesity or diabetes. I mean, it's raising a whole lot of new possibilities. So you can't really... Okay, so with yeah. epigenetics now, my students have brought up this point a few times, and I, I always giggled because I thought it was funny. They're like, the reason why a lot of the Chinese people are getting taller is because they like to play basketball now. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's an interesting take on the situation that, you know, basketball's been introduced recently, and they all, basketball players are taller, and they're jumping more. And that's, and so... It's one of those, I can't prove them wrong now, really, with epigenetics. I'm like, I think it's more to it than that. Diets have changed over the past few yes. years. Yes. Yeah. And so does the nature versus nurture. You know, again, is it what you eat, or is it what's genetically passed down? How tall are your parents? How tall are you? But society as a whole has been getting taller over um, hundreds of years. So environment yes. versus, so that, that can be linked to epigenetics. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't say that playing basketball... I know. 
a long stretch, but right. But who am I to cross that one off part of it? Yep. People are jumping more, trying to do things that taller people need to do. You know, like this is this is new. Yeah. You know, genetics is gonna it's gonna set the bounds on you to some extent. You know, yes. I mean, you know, I I wanted to be six foot, but I'm actually five ten and a half. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, no matter how much I wanted to, I don't, just don't think I was going to make it. But, uh, yeah, what other questions do you have about epigenetics? I may not be able to answer. Well, but. if a behavior then is attributed to the fact that there was this process in the genes, like the, di the, the mice that have diabetes, if, and you had to say whether it was nature versus nurture, it's both? Or? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd never say it was just one or the other. Always, it's always going to be... Yeah. Down, yep. So it's both. Yeah, absolutely. Huh. It's not, and it never should have been nature or nurture. Right, right. You know, it's really to what extent. And now it's, it's just complicated. Yes. I don't know if this is the way the side was getting at, but she was asking a question earlier about this study. But do you think that, like, do they test the offspring rats for fear of other stimulus? So, like, were they specifically more fearful of the odor, or were they just? I believe they tested in them on other odors, but I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. But somebody could Google it, look it up. So, yes. Do you have something that you use to help your student understand heritability? Yeah. Um, I try to explain. It's, it's so complicated. It's a simple definition, but they struggle with the idea that it's more within a group versus individual. Right. Um, I tend, I don't talk a lot about the number heritability, uh, other than I try and just emphasize, we're look, it's the, the individual differences, okay, among a group, okay, how well can you, can that, those differences be explained by genetics? Not, it's not to say that, you know, 70% of my intelligence was inherited. Uh, it's not quite what I mean by that. But I, I don't have any particular way that I, I help with that, so. I don't know, somebody could think of a good way and let me know. All right, so to summarize, um, epigenetic mechanisms, okay, uh, things that influence, okay, the outcome here, uh, things that occur during development, environmental chemicals, drugs, aging, diet. Uh, this shows a methyl group, the black carbon and three white hydrogen atoms stuck onto the DNA sequence. This shows the winding around the histone proteins which can be altered by these things binding to a portion of the histone protein. But in terms of the health endpoints, this has implications for cancer, autoimmunity, mental disorders, diabetes, um, obesity. It's... How about autism? Have you seen any studies on that? I mean, given the geometric progression of it? I haven't. Uh, there's a lot of possible explanations for those uh, increases, so I'm sure somebody will latch on to it. Okay. Yeah. This will be, you know, whatever explains everything in the future, right? So I, I don't know. Okay, so it's not nature or nurture, but think about the choices you're making now, how they could influence your posterity. Okay, uh, maybe a little more accountability for our behavior that it's uh, it's just me, right? Well, no, maybe it's me and my children and grandchildren and and what we're doing there. Yes, Steve. So I did look up that paper. I can only see the abstract, but it does say that the second next two generations had an increased odor uh, sensitivity to that conditioned odor, but not to other odors. But not to others, yeah. So it was that specific odor that they were conditioned. To. Yeah. So they did test other odors. What was the? What was the year of the study? Um. Um. Twenty thirteen. December two thousand thirteen, oh, I think. Wow. Yeah. Two thousand. Yeah. And I just literally just used the first parental olfactory experience. It's the first thing that came up. Sure. So now we have more to feel guilty about as if we Yeah, you know, it's like. 
it is your fault as a parent. You know, it really is your fault. So, but don't tell your kids that. Okay. Neither Richard. They'll they'll blame it on you one way or another. You know, they'll blame it on you. But, but maybe you could say, but yes, it's in your power to change, right? Okay. You can be better than I was.